Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Build Live, powered by Channel 9. I am Tim Hewer, and I'm grateful to uh, be joined by some fellow colleagues of mine to talk all about modernizing desktop apps on Windows. We have Mike Harsh and Joe Stegman here. Hello, all. Why don't you guys tell us what area in Windows you work on and, and why we should listen to you? That's a <laughs> wow, Tim. It's very, very judgy. Um, Great to be here. Thanks for hosting yes. us <laughs> so graciously. Um, so I'm on the Windows platform team. Um, I've been working on the Windows platform team for about 20 years. Started life uh, in Windows forums, and then worked on Silverlight, then worked on the Xbox. Been doing client stuff for the better part of 20 years. Um, currently, um, I own the uh, Windows SDK and the um, emulators and a bunch of the kind of desktop modernization technology that, that we're talking about. Awesome. So. Joe? And I'm Joe Stegman. I'm uh, uh, the group program manager, is what they call me, for the Windows UI platform. So that means the XAML platform that chips in Windows and like the XAML Island stuff you saw this morning. The plumbing, all that work comes from my team. UWP XAML is uh, work done by my team. I also own the accessibility platform in Windows as well. That's great. So we saw today was a day two keynote. Had uh, Joe and Kevin and Yina and Shilpa come out and talk a lot about you know different uh, chapters of the evolution of the Windows developer, or Microsoft 365 developer. Um, we saw some great things, new things for desktop developers, specifically for .NET developers. My highlight that I really liked was the UWP Islands. What can you tell us about that? What did we see in, in how, why should why should developers care about that? In you want to take this one, Joe? Oh, I'll, I'll start, Mike. I know uh, I know you'll add some color commentary. I, <laughs> I know it's in your nature. Um, so it, it's a, it's one of the things that I'm most excited about as well. Uh, our you know uh, our team's been actually working on this for for a while, but um, w we see a lot of developers. Um, I, I was I was also in Silverlight way back in the days, and uh, I remember way back in the early days of WPF when WPF was just starting to take off and Windows Forms was already taking off. And there was so much passion around people building these rich client applications. And over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, um, we've slowly started to put more of our emphasis in UWP XAML and sort of this modern, touch-friendly, ink-friendly UI platform. And there's still this tremendous amount of passion in developers who have these WPF and Windows Forms applications um, and even you know, VB6 applications. And so a lot of those want to take advantage of some of the new innovations we've done in the, in the UI platform. And so the islands give them the ability to now start to use some of the fluent innovations, the modern web view, for example, swap chain panel, some of the things that we hear developers saying, hey, can I get that from my WPF or Windows Forms application? Now they can get it and host it directly into their WPF or Windows Forms application without having to, if you will, uh, modernized, converted to UWP. So we know a lot of developers are excited about this. Um, we're excited internally about this. There's really still a lot more that we want to do in this space. Um, but uh, that's why I think developers will, will be excited about it. Yeah, I mean, the, th the thing I'm really excited about for, from this XAML Islands perspective is obviously everything Joe said is completely true. I want to kind of take it a step further from how I, just thinking about my own experience and things that I want to do. I I've always kind of been bugged that um, when you have uh, you know, the UWP XAML stack, and you have that inside of your application, um, you're a little constrained from the perspective of a lot of the things you want to do from a desktop perspective, because you're running in an app container. Um, if you want to ship in the Windows Store, you have kind of a, a limited set of APIs you want to call. And you know, being on the WinForms team for so long, I really did a lot of things in my apps that were you know, talking to a lot of different you know, Windows APIs. Obviously, you had the entire .NET framework stack. Right. You could p-invoke to anything. Um, you wanted to talk to USB device. You want to talk to an arbitrary IoT thing you have plugged in. Like, it all kind of works. And so the idea of being able to basically, you know, uh, I, in my head I'm imagining basically like uh, a WinForms app with a kind of a doc fill, to use the WinForms term, XAML Island, um, and basically using, you know, the XAML UI stack, but basically in a full trust manner where you can then go party on anything you want to do from a desktop perspective because, you know, you get the best of a modern UI and all the best of the desktop functionality. So that's kind of how I have it in my head, how to stitch and, it together. And this allows an evolution for a developer to not wholesale, just say, well, I need to be all in on UWP now, right? Or, that's correct. And yep. I can kind of bring some of my assets forward. Yep. And in fact, as you guys are former members of the Windows forums, not WinForms, that's right. Thank, forms, thank you, Mr. Hewer. You're the only person on the planet who does well, know that. It's my goal to educate the world, Joe. So uh, Windows Forms, not WinForms. That's correct. I said it both uh, ways earlier today. So. <laughs> yeah. 
but we, this is not a new concept there as well, right? You know, we, we heard similar feedback, and as we evolved, continue modern platforms and Windows forms, you could, uh, you know, gradually mm -hmm. host islands of WPF and things like that. So this is a, a natural evolution of that kind of pattern that we've seen in, in developers and allows us to do that. Now, one of the things that, that I see is UWP and the focus and fluent design, right? So very strong design language, good, good uh, perspective about design. How does that mix with a traditional line of business uh, application when we use these island approaches? Yeah, so when you um, think about desktop density, not just um, you know, animations and things like that, but... Uh, yeah, you can think of uh, Fluent um, is, it's built on top of, or if you will, it's the branding that we apply to our default UWP XAML controls, or part of it is the branding we apply. But um, they're, they can be branded in many different ways. And one of the things that we've done uh, we'll, we'll do when, um, when we release the next version of UWP XAML is we're providing the ability to, if you will, do a kind of compact sizing style, which is we give you the ability to make the style um, look more like a traditional WPF or Windows Forms application. You can also, and we continue to investigate, you know, would somebody want to go the other way? We think of this as, I'm bringing an island, and so do you want to brand like the island or do you want to brand like your existing app, and right now we're kind of optimizing as a first step to branding like your existing app. So let's make that island, if you will, be able to look through a style like the rest of your app, or like right. a traditional desktop app on on you know Windows 7 or on Windows 10. Um, but we'll look to see in the future if it's a case of you know we find that there's a lot of feedback that hey, I actually want to update my traditional app to make it look more like a more fluent, fluent style, then we'd investigate whether or not it makes sense for us to do a style in WPF that's more of a fluent type style and therefore you'd get the, the branding that way. Your island and, and would look like fluent in your WPF or Windows Forms app even right. would look like so, that. And so again, that's something that we're, we're taking feedback on. Right. So Joe, did I, uh, did I hear right that we're going to be able to have a WinForms look and feel inside of UDP XAML? Because <laughs> that gets me excited. Yeah, but I know Battleship Gray. I mean, right. be the winning style sheet all over again. It's coming back. It's Battleship coming back. Gray is the new black. It, yeah. For sure. <laughs> that's right. So once again, we're here live on, on Channel 9. Feel free to log in and ask your questions. The topic right now is talking about modernizing desktop apps on Windows and all about UWP and XAML and Windows SDK. Um, Mike, you mentioned Windows SDK. So modernizing is not just about the UI. No. What are other ways developers well, should that, think about and can modernize that's, their desktop That's apps? definitely um, the newer, the newest thing, in fact, that we just announced around modernization. Um, the, the thing that we've uh, been pushing and, and talking about enabled in the last year, year and a half perhaps, um, is was we call it Centennial, Project Centennial, which is a desktop app converter. Um, and that let you take a desktop application and package it inside of um, an AppX container, which gave you all of the awesome deployment characteristics so you really don't have to think about updates. You don't have to worry about um, uninstall, uh, install, you know, rotting issues. You don't really have to worry about other apps kind of tromping on your app and, and stopping it from working. Um, it also lets you call a bunch of the wi um, other Windows APIs that were available, right? Because it gave you a package ID so that you could call some things that needed that, like notifications or live tiles. Um, now, the, the thing that we talked about ev evolving that today was MSIX. Um, and that basically is the, you know, Kevin called it the next generation packaging format. I like to think of it as, AppX, F2, MSIX, Enter, right? I mean, it's basically, uh, it's renaming the technology, and we've, we've done that for a couple of reasons, because people really do think about MSI very strongly as a, as a brand name and associate that with setup, right. and we want to basically let people know that AppX is the continuation of that, and hence the name MSIX. Um, from, a, from a conversion standpoint, we're also introducing a bunch of new tools to make it easier to use um, to, or take existing packages and get them into an MSIX. And so we have this new IT Pro tool that we're working on that Kevin talked about in the keynote that will basically handle bulk conversion, will handle many more scenarios, including installers that have UI, installers that may um, do some things that uh, don't work really well today from, from a packaging perspective as far as installation goes on an AppX. Let's say you're writing to certain folders that are really prone to have issues around uninstalled or other apps tromping on them. We're going to have a redirection shim library to take care of that, that, that the um, app IT Pro tool will take care of basically including that in your app for you. So basically, we're really targeting kind of repackaging every app that you have in your, inside of your enterprise into an MSIX and making that really easy so that you can use that um, across all your apps and then all your devices, which is why we made the announcement about MSIX on Windows 7. Right. right so you can have one package to rule them all. Good segue for a question that we saw. Um, why Gabriel is asking, why does MSIX support things like Android and iOS? How does that work? That's a good question. Um, so the, the lead into that is that um, MSIX is 
uh, the reader and, and uh, the format writer basically is an open source project on GitHub um, that we published recently. And we added um, iOS, Android, and Mac OS ports for that so that you can basically take the package, read the manifest, and kind of get the contents from it um, on any of those platforms. Now, we're doing that so that you can use MSIX as truly a portable container format. But the idea of installing an app on, on those other platforms is a, a thing that's basically left up to an application that wants to use MSIX as a container on those other platforms. Got it. Okay. The, the driving force for that was uh, another Microsoft customer um, whose brand is quite large, but I can't name them, um, who is desired to use MSIX as a cross-platform um, extensibility model and have that be the package for it. And so the, you need to have, if you're going to be a cross-platform extensibility model, you need to have readers for all those different platforms, and they're using that. So that's the kind of the genesis of, of that Got it. tech. So Joe, one of the other things that we heard in the keynote this morning, and this is a great question that we have here, was WinUI. So maybe you can tell us what that is first, and then we'll get to the, the question from the Sure, I, I love the question. Because um, it, it, it's clear that there's a little bit more clarification that we can do on the keynote right. announcement this morning. So um, for the Windows 10 controls, uh, what we've traditionally done is that we build a new control and we ship it on the latest version of Windows. So the menu bar, for example, which is one of the questions that the person is, is asking about, and the question is, can they use the new menu bar control? And if so, what versions of Windows can they use it on? Well, traditionally what we've done is we've just shipped them in the latest version of Windows. But you know, as we've been looking over the last couple of years, we realized that most of the controls we're building, they're, they're not tied to any specific capability in the latest version of Windows. And for us to get adoption and feedback and really consistency in apps, it would be better if we provided those controls just as a NuGet, if you will, out of band and made it so the developers could use those in their existing applications, existing Windows 10 applications. So yeah, so WinUI, what it is, is it's our library of just our platform controls. So the same controls that actually ship in the platform, it's some set of those platform controls, including menu bar, that we ship additionally in a NuGet that works in down-level versions of Windows. So I think it's roughly TH2 and a, what we call TH2. Right. Uh, you, Tim, maybe you can convert the, <laughs> that to the actual I don't, number. I've lost my decoder ring. I don't have yeah, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. It was like the whatever, something preview, I don't know, fall preview. Fall update. Thing. Yeah, probably. update. Yeah. Something like Anyway, so. Don't you mean autumn? Why are, you, why are you so North American focused, Tim? <laughs> We're really trying to take them back as far as it, if you will, makes sense to take them back. So we look at adoption numbers and based on the adoption numbers and assuming there isn't anything specific in that control that needs to take advantage of something on the latest version of Windows and there's not a lot on menu bar that and, needs to and do so that. And so some of those that might be specific would be like where there's foundational elements that we rely on, which those have advanced. Maybe it's some things like ink or web platform or media. Like those tend to be some of those things that are, you know, have yeah. deeper talons in the, in the platform. Exactly, and, th and there's really two camps I'll say is that exactly what you're saying is there's some things that are just tied to like, we added ink fundamentally plumbed it through the whole system, and right. so the exposure of ink is sort of tied to a later version of Windows. But then there are other things, like we have a lot of our base controls, take uh, you know, Combo Box, for example. And we haven't, w uh, we started this exercise maybe two, two and a half, three years ago, but the controls that predated that, we haven't gone through yet and, and tried to decouple them from capabilities they may have that were just tied to the latest version of Windows. Even though we may not necessarily have to tie them to it, we just haven't decoupled them so they can also be shipped, if you will, out of band. But that's something we'll continue to, to look at. But everything new we build now, um, you know, navigation pane, menu bar, all those controls. That's going to be a pattern them. we see going forward. That's right. Unless and we and have a good standard, just like we have 30, I mean, this, this really is how we've been asking developers to develop controls and how we have been asking them to distribute. We're kind of now revealing that we have, like you said, it's been kind of been going on for a little bit internally, but now that we have it kind of baked a little bit more, we're able to do it ourselves. The dev experience is the same as if I was getting a third party control, right? Exactly. Find and it on NuGet, add it. Yeah, and this is great for both us and for developers is because we get feedback for developers now where before we had to, we only got feedback on developers using the latest version. And so it's great for us to get that feedback. But now we get consistency on all versions of Windows 10, for example, because developers, rather than saying, I need a menu, I'll use somebody's version of a menu, this Callisto Toolkit version of menu on, on one version. Great and then, it. yeah, on the latest version, I'll use the Windows one. And usually they don't even do that. This way, we can now give them something that really is just the same as the platform control. So they get you know, higher quality, and it works in market, and we get the feedback, and you get consistency in terms of apps uh, running on the platform. This, so isn't, this isn't a side project. 
internal teams, apps that we use on Windows are using WinUI. That's it. They've actually been doing it for a couple years. This is how we develop our, our controls internally now. We've even taken a step further with, uh, with DataGrid. Um, and then all, all three of us here, ironically, used to work on, on Silverlight. Um, but we, oh, we yeah. took the, yes, exact. Uh, wait, was I oh, supposed to say Silverlight? Right? Yeah, we're supposed yeah. to drink? Yeah. <laughs> what are we supposed to do, Mike? Yeah, there you go. Um, but uh, with the data grid, we even took it a step further, which is we basically productized that, and now we're shipping it as part of the toolkit and providing source for that as well. And so we want to try a couple different options, see what resonates well with our developer community, and based on what resonates well and what they ask for, we may invest more in one way versus versus the other way. So that's great. We're, we're super excited about that. Good to hear. Good to hear. Let's look at some more questions here. Um, okay, so Alan is asking, will MSIX come to Windows 8 or just Windows 7 and 10? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, we still have yet to figure out the full roadmap for that. Um, okay. I, I have a hard time imagining something is going to work on Windows 7 but not also work on Windows 8, given that, you know, how compatibility typically works on Windows with supersetting APIs, so. Okay, good answer. Uh, Andy is asking, can somebody today host UWP inside of WPF? If so, how? So the, the technology we just released was to enable that. So once we have that shipping, which will be out, what's the official messaging on that, Tim? Um, the next version of Windows. Yes. The next version of Windows. Shipping later in 2018. Thank you. Just trying to make sure I don't say anything yeah, yeah. to get well, myself the, in. The verbiage I used during my session, I told people, Let's, we're shipping Windows every six months. We got one we're going to ship later this year. And after that, we're going to keep shipping every six months. The update right. to the April update. And the update yeah, to the April yeah. update is when we'll enable the technology. Are we allowed to say it. April these days? Uh, <laughs> I, I hope. So. But, that, but that is the most reliable way of doing that in that, That's correct. And, and just to, you know, to step back from that, too, is that um, what we're actually doing is we're exposing the UWP XAML controls or give you a way to host the UWP or expose them as HWINs, if you will. So WPF, Windows Forms, and even Win32 apps already support HWINs. What we're actually building into the platform is a way now to host the UWP XAML controls as HWINs, and therefore anything that's HWIN based, you can then host it in. Great. And the hosting model is fairly lightweight. You, I mean, it's designed to have, you know, maybe not thousands, but definitely hundreds. Like it's, I mean, you know, don't, don't go crazy, but you can, you can. You don't have to be super economical with them either. When you when you say thousands, you're talking about islands. Yes. Okay. Not any yes. type of elements. Like, don't put a million individual islands no. in, in a WPF app. No. Got and, it. Okay. And one thing, the the reason that this is not something that'll probably be like WinUI is that we actually had to make some more fundamental changes into the platform to make our, if you will, our input systems work with Win32 input and that sort of thing to get this working. It really was a you know fair amount of work to get these XAML islands, if you will, booted up. And that work is likely going to be specific to the up, update to the April update, <laughs> if you will. So um, if we think about how a typical XAML developer works, and then we throw islands into the mix, in fact, in Kevin's uh, app that he was showing in, in the keynote, how does the data flow in between like a WPF app and now an island? Is that one of those fundamental changes? Well, that's a, that's a really great question, Tim. Right, because the magic of it is you're just hosting it in the exact same .NET instance in the same thread, right? So um, in my session, which I just came from, um, I showed uh, actually two XAML islands. One had an in canvas, one had an in toolbar, and they were connected in in the WinForms event handler code, and it just works. They talked to, to each other as if you know they were hosted in in a UWP app, but they were hosted in a UWP app. So basically, you're in the same thread, same process. You're binding to the existing .NET desktop instance that's running in that WinForms or WPF app, and so all your .NET types are the exact same. As so you could just pass data just through. Pass through. Like Kevin showed, actually, his demo showed two-way data mining. So in, in WPF, he had a data object, and it was talking to the XAML island, and they were talking in both directions. Great. That's, so. that's really good to hear. Um, I believe you owe Joe 40 bucks because I heard you say WinForms twice. We'll move on to the next question. Windows Forms, uh, yeah. He probably doesn't owe me 40 bucks. Yeah. Royalty. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, oh, no, more, more MSIX <laughs> questions, Mike. This is a popular topic. Uh, a couple more minutes left. Let's get to some of these. When will MSIX become generally available, i.e. not just source on GitHub, but actually integrated into VS proper, accepted into the store as packages, et cetera? Great question. So um, the first kind of two steps on this are um, the update to the April update, um, aka the one coming later this year, will have the operating system recognize MSIX as a thing. It's, it will be like, like AppX is today. 
right? And in, in the April update um, and many previous updates, you can double click on AppX, you get an installation experience, installation experience. Um, that, that is uh, the install experience you'll have for MSIX starting later this year. Um, Visual Studio will, today, um, you can go take an existing WinForms or WF app, you can add a packaging project, which is another project, and also generate an AppX project. That will start generating an MSIX again later this year uh, with a Visual Studio update. And we're also working with the VS team to add more direct support for MSIX into WinForms and WF projects, so you don't have to have a separate project. You can just basically say, give me an MSIX, much like you can with ClickOnce today for an existing project. So that's, that's all work that will happen um, later this year for the packaging projects in MSIX and early next year for additional VS support. So I think you answered this before, but Gabriel's also asking, is MSIX essentially a replacement for AppX? If I have AppXs, should I, should I move to them? Are we going to provide any tools to migrate to that pattern? AppX is MSIX. Again, if, if you have a bunch of AppXs and you want to be MSIXs, you should use Explorer, Control A, F2, dot MSIX, enter, and you've just converted your AppXs to MSIXs. Step three, profit. Step three, profit, that's Got right. It. Okay. Um, let's do a couple more questions here. Uh, Shabista is asking, uh, can you throw some more light on WinUI? What different experience will it create than what is there currently? So um, the, the key thing that WinUI brings is it's the same controls that chip in the platform, but now you can use them on not just the latest version of Windows 10, but you can use them on previous versions of Windows 10. So that really is the, the main update that we're bringing there. Same controls, but now you as a developer don't have to wait for the latest version of Windows 10 to use them. You can now use them on previous versions of Windows 10. So down level support. That's correct. But also fundamentally the deployment model, sorry, the distribution model is different, which allows you and your team now to continue to add that out of band. So those are kind of two keys, right? Yeah, that, uh, that's a good point, Tim, is that uh, we are making them available out of band, and we're providing a new Git so that you as a developer, can, can you consume them via new Git, and that means you can actually do app local versions of it. And we're also looking at ways to do what we call in Windows 10 a framework package so that we can also do a shared instance of the package on the hard drive so it doesn't take up as much space. That's great. Well, we're almost out of time, gentlemen. I uh, really appreciate you joining us. Mike, I think you'll be joining us a little bit later as well to talk more about some of the other things we talked about in the keynote related specifically to .NET developers. Yeah, Mr. Hunter and I will be here. That's awesome. I look forward to hosting Reporting you Reporting for duty. Uh, Joe, good seeing you as always. And nice seeing you, Tim. Very nice excited. seeing you, Mike. It's been a while, Joe. It's yeah. been a while. <laughs> We're very excited about all the, uh, the new improvements for modernizing desktop apps and uh, excited to see what developers uh, have to do with them. So uh, I'm sure you guys will be looking on the horizons of uh, how people will start modernizing their apps and using some of these features. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks All for right. having Thanks, us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Take care.